So uh, Puerto Rico is part of the Caribbean, right? The part of the Caribbean archipelago. And it is the easternmost of the greater Antilles. Um, and it is in, in and of itself made up, it is an archipelago, which is made of the big island, right? Puerto Rico, the main island, um, Vieques, La Isla Nena, and Culebra. Uh, I hope that you guys can see my cursor. Can you? No? Oh. Uh, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, we can see it. It's just like yeah, we could see it. Okay. okay. Yeah. So Culebra, Vieques, um, the rest of Puerto Rico. Um, now, for the last 500 years, Puerto Rico uh, has been really a military fortress in many ways, right? It's been a some kind of an outpost for whatever colonial empire was trying to uh, have us. Um, and then since 1898, after the uh, Treaty of Paris um, for the Spanish-American War, we've been a colony of the United States. Uh, uh, now, in 1941, the U.S. passed a Public Law 247, which allowed the U.S. Navy to expropriate 78% of all of the land in Vieques. And as a result of this massive expropriation, the vast majority of the Akinses were forcibly relocated to the middle of the island, right? Uh, to this smaller strip of the island. So this is a map of Vieques in 1940 and where everybody was uh, sort of a census of where people were located. And this is of 1950 um, after the majority of the, of the uh, expropriation. Now, most of these uh, displacements happen in with you know 24 hours notice. And although some of the landowners, the larger landowners, were compensated, the vast majority of the people in Vegas were not um, small property owners, families, uh, and people who were sort of the equivalent of, of sharecroppers here in the United States. They were certainly not compensated at all. Uh, and a lot of this was done quite violently. Now, as you can see from this map, this is basically how Vieques was, uh, ended up being divided. Uh, here at the Western tip, you can see uh, it was function as a munition storage area. And then in the Eastern part of the island, it functioned as a maneuvering practice area and then the, the live uh, ammunition uh, target area, the live impact uh, area is what they, they call it officially. Now in 1961, the Department of Defense actually tried to abolish Vieques as a municipality and remove all of the Vieques from the island, but in the end that was not politically feasible. Actually tried to do this a couple of times, um, but you know they they weren't unable to do it. Uh, you know this of course means that the relationship between the people of Vieques and the military, the soldiers, was it's complicated. It always was really complicated, um, but always also filled with violence, right? Structural and physical uh, violence as well. You used to saying here the plan. Dracula. Yes, that was that was one of those events where they wanted to take a strip of land so that the soldiers, uh, the servicemen could go back and forth between the areas. Um, but they would have had to take uh, excavate the cemetery, and they called that Plan Dracula. Um, of course, that in the end did not uh, occur either. Um, so, what I was saying is that the. The Navy's expropriation, occupation, and exploitation of Vieques uh, has had and really continues to have many social consequences. It, they limited the, the, there was limited infrastructure at the time, but they also limited what the, the infrastructure that could be developed over time. And so this really complicated the situation and led to increases in poverty and few educational and healthcare and, uh, and employment opportunities as compared to the main island of Puerto Rico. And this also sort of contributed to a mass exodus that you know, started out in the 1940s, uh, but continues to this day. Now I've filled this up with a bunch of images uh, and I have a, a lot of numbers about, uh, you know, 
tons of bombs and all of that. But essentially, there were many varieties of bombs and artilleries that were dropped, some of which are still undisclosed by the Navy. They also rented out Vieques to other NATO allies, and we don't have a clear sense of what those allies were using uh, at the time. I'm sure the Navy has a clear sense, but they're not disclosing that. Many of these bombs uh, ended up changing the topography of the island, the, the uh, landscape of the island. Excuse me. Some of them never were never exploded, so we have thousands upon thousands of unexploded ordinances in the area. Uh, it was really in the 1940s, in 1948 specifically, that the first full-scale war games were done in, in Vieques. And this means that there were over 60 ships, 350 planes, and 50,000 troops from all of the military branches that just descended upon this island and the population there in a situation that, that felt like a war. Um, that's exactly what they were planning, you know, they were, they were uh, training for. Um, but it was also at this time that uh, protests began, right? The, the people in Vegas did not take this landing down. They started protesting uh, fairly quickly after the expropriation started occurring. I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, in a bit. Now, in 1971, uh, there was a series of protests that were happening in Culebra, which was actually uh, also used for, for uh, military maneuvering, but since the 1920s, so they had already had a very long uh, term you know, situation with the Navy as well. Um, and when that, that base closed in 1975, all of those military activities were then moved to Vieques. And so we see a, an exponential escalation of bombing that occurred on the island. And really the majority of the days of the year, the people in Vegas were then subjected to bombing and other kinds of maneuvering. It wasn't uh, really until the end of the 1970s that uh, the US decided that, you know, they probably should start keeping better records of what it is that they are finding uh, with regards to environmental pollution. Uh, that's when they started looking at, you know, sampling and testing for water quality uh, and soil quality. Uh, they, of course, found incredibly high levels of lead and zinc and RDX and, you know, all the contaminants that, you, that they tested for at the time uh, in both ground and, and drinking water, um, you know, as, as you would imagine. Um, between 1983 and 1998, they dropped 17,700 bombs on Vieques. They, they, we have the best data for the bombs that were dropped since the 1980s and, and beyond the data before that is, is rather, you know, uh, inconsistent. Um, it wasn't really until 1988 that they started tracking what the military uh, maneuvers were, how they were impacting endangered species, for example. So all of this really started, you know, I, I remember when those things were happening, right? Like I was a little girl uh, and, and I remember my family talking about those things. Um, in 1998, when I was already a college student, uh, that year alone, they dropped 22,000 bombs. And um, they have admitted to dropping uh, on February 19th of 1999, 263 rounds of depleted uranium, which is highly toxic. Um, and they only admitted to doing it uh, on May of that year because people in Vegas had realized what had happened and called them out on it. So we really are sort of dealing with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of tons of bombs um, that were dropped and continue to be in the land water um, of Vieques. Now, as I said, in 1943, the first protests uh, took place and those protests were really more about the loss of jobs, the loss of land and livelihood, right? Uh, now in the decades to come, there was a shift a bit in those in the nature of the protests and why people were were fighting and and still land jobs livelihood but also i remember that there was a there was a 
a shift to a mo movement of peace, right? Like we're fighting over peace. It's, it's una paz para viejos. Um, in the in the early 1990s, um, the Comité para para el Desarrollo y Rescate de Vieques was established by community activists. Uh, you know, throughout for for many decades, it was a fight that was led by fishermen and you know groups of women. Benjamin uh, Napagan is here with us, uh, who who were sort of leading this fight. But it wasn't really until uh, April 19th of 1999 when uh, some fighter uh, fighter jets dropped a bomb on um, a private security guard, David Sanes Rodriguez, that really this sort of thing exploded at the national and international level. And there were camps that were set up from 1999 to 2001, so these civil disobedient camps, civil disobedience camps. Um, that really led to sort of that final push to get the Navy out. And I have some pictures for you. These are uh, these were earlier on pictures of uh, stuff that happened in the 70s and 80s. Um, but this is the stuff that happened when I was in college. This is the, the stuff I remember. Um, these were like massive marches for Puerto Rico, todo Puerto Rico con Vieques. Um, and you know, I actually know this person, this is Tito Otero being arrested at one of the camps. Um, no lo puedo ver de 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 oh, somebody is, um, uh, this is Fuera la Marina de Quivieques, this is some of the camps. And this is sort of a, a memorial, no? Que, that was done when we had a countdown already for when the Navy was going to leave. So these are some of the images. Um, so on June 14th of 2001, uh, the president of the United States, which uh, by then was George W. Bush, uh, announced that there would be a cease of all military activities. But then by 2003, but then of course, people got even more resolute and said, no, nah, nah, not one more bomb. Uh, and so the protests actually intensified at the time. Um, and it was on May 1st of 2003 that the Navy, um, you know, withdrew fully and, and turned over the lands to the Department of the Interior, uh, declaring it a, a wildlife refuge and a super fun site. So as you can imagine, um, 60 years of, of bombing led to significant environmental degradation and there are uh, many unexploded ordinances on land and sea, as I've mentioned before. And here's just some of the images that uh, people have captured over the years. Um, there are things that are, I have another picture. For example, there is a submarine tank that has these barrels that are oozing chemicals and no one's actually really sure what's in these barrels. Um, but we know, you know, there's areas that people can actually reach and get to. Um, and there's been many accidents with people uh, getting severely critically injured. Um, and this is sort of what we've got, you know, no, don't access beyond this point. Uh, now, one of the things that has been really clear is that uh, although after 2005, the EPA placed that the bombing range and the surrounding waters as a super fun site uh, officially, there have not been a, any decontamination efforts. And the cleanup efforts that have occurred are actually just sort of burning the brush uh, and then looking over with um, you know, helicopters and the like, seeing what they can find and then going in. If it's something that they can easily remove, then they might remove it, but mainly they just blow it up and they blow it up in open detonations. So all, you know, they're no longer being bombed, but they're still being uh, exposed to all of the chemicals and all of the contaminants that would uh, that are you know happen when something blows up, uh, you know, never mind the actual danger to the people that are doing the blowing up. So the complex nature of the of the military's impact on the health of Vieques has really touched every part, every aspect of life in Vieques and. We're talking really about limited access to healthcare services and forcing residents to travel great distances for any kind of specialized care. 
And so here, this, uh, this picture here is of the uh, current hospital, if you will. <laughs> um, there is no hospital. The CDT was uh, sort of destroyed after Hurricane Maria. And there, um, you know, the government, the Puerto Rican or the federal government have not yet uh, built anything new, anything that will actually serve the needs of the people in Vieques. And currently, there's also incredible problems with the transportation the, the, uh, between Vieques and uh, Ceiba, which is where the, the ferry port is at. Um, things are broken. They're giving uh, priority to tourists for the most part. Um, so there's really, there's been a lot of protests if you're look, watching the news lately in Puerto Rico, you would have caught this. Um, and so, you know, in a colonial relationship, the, the oppressor is the one that has the power, right? So in addition to the deaths due to the accidental bombs that went off or the direct violent encounters that happened with the servicemen throughout the years in Vieques, uh, the Navy also just limited economic development and health and the transportation infrastructure and just overall made life harder for the people in Vegas uh, in ways that it really didn't need to be. Now, one of the arguments that, uh, big arguments that ultimately pushed the Navy out was that the health impact that all of the chemicals that they were using were, was having on the people in Vegas. Now, um, those of you who are not in public health, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease, Disease Registry is the scientific sort of the research arm for environmental issues of the CDC, of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And in 2003 and then in 2013, they um, shelled out these reports where they were meant to assess the impact of the Navy's activities on the health of vegans. Now, the first one was, uh, you know, relatively quickly dismissed for a bunch of uh, methodological flaws. But the second has had a, a more enduring effect. And despite some very clear methodological limitations. And, you know, I think that it's important that we understand that this is actually, these reports are the basis for policy. For what cases determine budget and guidelines and decontamination efforts support for healthcare access, like these reports actually matter very much at the federal level. So in the 2013 one, they stated uh, almost unequivocally that there is no evidence uh, that the Navy's activities pose any real threat to human health. And that, uh, you know, they divided their analysis in these pathways, uh, mainly consumption, right? Fish consumption, local produce and, and livestock and drinking water. Uh, biomonitoring, which is uh, getting, you know, blood, saliva, uh, hair samples, and the like, uh, urine samples, um, and air and soil. And so uh, they basically, you know, here I'm, I'm giving you the, the gist of what they found in each of those dimensions. Of course, I'm paraphrasing in some of them, some poetic justice here. Uh, but essentially that they concluded that the higher rates of the different kinds of health problems that exist in Vieques was really because of uh, lifestyle and behavioral um, aspects. Uh, they smoke too much or they drink too much or they are eating the wrong things or, you know, those kinds of, they're not exercising enough, that kind of thing. Uh, however, on the other hand, you have a bunch of independent scientists from different areas of the world and different, uh, you know, expertise that are all saying like, well, actually, no, there, there is something here. There are abnormally high levels of metals and toxins that have been found on blood, hair, nail samples of Yekis residents and in the soil, groundwater, drinking water, uh, house dust, plant life, aquatic life, you know, you name it. Um, there are also incredibly high rates of cancer, neurological disorders, asthma, uh, reproductive disorders um, in Puerto Rico and other comparable samples around the world. So, you know, not so fast. So needless to say, this has, you know, this is a lot of conflicting information. And after really a century of abuse, uh, vacances are, uh, 
you know, very weary and distrustful of government reports, especially of the government that bombed them. Um, and they're also beauty of, you know, researchers and, you know, ultimately nothing has changed in the last 20 years since the Navy left. And so kind of where does that leave us, right? How can we find out which contaminants got to human populations and how they did they get there? And how can we address this in a way that addresses community concerns and these decades of mistrust? So this is where this particular project comes in. Um, in 2018, uh, the US Congress through in its Appropriations Act uh, requ required, it basically told the EPA, you need to put money down for a project or you know, multiple projects, however they wanted to do it, um, to look at how the Navy impact the health of uh, Vieques through the soil, seas, plants, animal, human population, um, and want testing, evaluation, quantification, mitigation. They wanted it all. So the EPA went ahead and did an RFA uh, and they called it Addressing Environmental Concerns in Vieques, Puerto Rico through Community-Based Participatory Research. So what is uh, CVPR? This is, uh, this is really an approach to doing community health and health inequities uh, research and it's central on social justice and equity. It, it traces its roots to Paulo Freire uh, and his, his popular education movement and participatory action research. And it recognizes that health, inequity, health inequities will not disappear until social equity that is embedded in social structures, higher, power hierarchies until that's actually addressed. So some of the uh, core principles of uh, CVPR are here. Um, it, is a, it is a process where partners contribute equally. They're engaged in co-learning and power sharing. There's a clear mandate for local capacity building and local systems development uh, and empowerment and to translate the process of the research and the outcome of the research into uh, something tangible that the community can actually use. Um, Successful long-term partnerships, they really require uh, these sort of critical practices of cultural humility and, and cultural safety. And cultural humility is when we all, uh, all of the members of the project, right, uh, acknowledge and, and reflect upon those power imbalances and when we actually do something to address that. Whereas cultural safety is where we're promoting a broader awareness of the social context, right? Of the historical context, of the economic context uh, that determine these health disparities, these health inequities, and a little bit our own role in perpetuating those uh, health inequities. And so when we adopt these um, practices and these principles, we're, we're, the idea is that we're engaging in sort of a mutually beneficial and non-paternalistic partnership. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, this study will use, uh, use a CVPR um, to, to really look at these three goals, right? We, wanted, we want to um, establish exposure pathways. We wanna try to understand how did these contaminants get to human populations um, and how did those impact health. How, how do people move, right? Um, and we're doing this through different methodologies, but essentially, instead of it being a place-based assessment where people are sort of sampled in different um, parts of Vieques and, and where air quality and soil quality and water are sampled in very specific parts of Vieques, uh, we're actually following the people. We're saying, okay, you tell me where it is that people are, people exist, and how, como se mueven, no? how people move around in their environment, because that's what's going to tell us where they might have been exposed, and not the other way around, which is how uh, mainly other, you know, certainly the ATSDR had been doing their sampling. We're also going to establish a 
data monitoring system, essentially a community-led uh, contaminant self-monitoring system. Uh, and finally, we're doing a plant-based remediation for soil matters. How can we clean up the soil so that it can be used more efficiently for the purposes that the community wants them uh, to be used? And in this case, we're sort of doing it um, initially for agricultural purposes. Now, the when we were designing this and sort of thinking it through, it was always really important that this has to have tangible benefits for people in Mieke. So uh, these are the five that were, are more easily identifiable. The sustainable development in, in that the activities are meant to address current concerns and the concerns of future generations um, because they're based on the priorities and strategies that are being proposed by local farms, health, civic organizations, entrepreneurial organizations. Um, the community will also be able to self-monitor contaminants without the need for the federal government to necessarily come in. Um, a lot of the activities that we're planning are very youth focused um, and hopefully we'll be connecting uh, youth into the pipeline for higher ed, into, into the STEAM fields, uh, science, technology, education, art, and math uh, at the University of Puerto Rico, uh, UMass Boston, and, and other institutions. Uh, we are producing some local employment. It's, it's limited. It's not uh, you know, forever employment, but some uh, project coordinator, interviewers, uh, interpreters. Um, and finally, and this was very important to folks in Vieques, we are creating a central depository of information of all kinds government reports that are sometimes very hard to find, historical records, previous scientific studies, uh, previous all kinds of studies. Uh, so if anybody has something they, they would like to share uh, with the people in Vieques, please um, contact me and we will discuss that further. Um, now this is our, um, our map, if you will, of the different phases. We are currently here at Phase one, sort of the first steps, um, we have already established the Community Academic Steering Committee. We are in the process of determining the CVPR guiding principles and the specific illness that we're gonna be focusing on for the rest of the study. Now, during phase uh, two, once we know what that illness is, we're gonna do the human health and ecological risk assessments. Uh, we're going to be using citizen science uh, workshops for, um, to teach some uh, Vietnamese to do sort of data extraction and to plot these timelines. We're essentially creating maps of where people were living uh, over time, where they spend a lot of uh, time uh, throughout their lives. And then we're going to be sort of integrating this information um, into GIS and I'm actually going to be it's gonna look very cool because any given person, you'll be able to see sort of where you live now, but also sort of looking back in time. I always think about it as one of those little books where you can do like, and then you can see the whole, that's how I imagine it. It's actually not gonna look like that, but that's sort of the idea. And we're going to be uh, doing in phase three, the contaminant assessment. And again, with citizen science uh, community members, uh, youth in particular, are going to learn how to use uh, something called an AmpliBlock sensor, uh, which are highly um, portable and deployable and much less expensive than traditional methods to be able to um, self-assess what the different contaminants are in Vieques, their levels, uh, you know, and, and see where they are. Um, and then finally, the remediation phase four is uh, the plant-based remediation. And I see Adam Corom Carmona just joined us. He's the PI for that uh, particular phase. Now, all right. So I'm gonna talk today about the first phase because that's where we are now. Um, the steering committee is made up at community-based organizations, community members at large and academic representatives. The scientific team are the PIs, uh, senior scientists, collaborators, and students. 
And the external advisory board are people that are, you know, technical experts, government agencies inside Vieques, Puerto Rico, and the US, um, as well as people and organizations that have specific expertise or knowledge and that have worked in Vieques, but that are not from Vieques. Um, for example, longtime researchers Cruz Maria Nazario and Jorge Colón are part of our external advisory board. A civic leader Justo Mendez Aramburu is also a part of the board. So we're very lucky to have folks that really know the island. Now the steering committee is a, this is basically their, their, their function, right? They're a decision-making governance kind of board. Um, they are going to be deciding with the uh, scientific team uh, in part, the illness that will be the focus of the study, the sites for data collection. Um, they will contribute to analysis and interpretation of the results uh, and dissemination of results. They make procedural and logistics recommendations, uh, again, share findings through all kinds of methods, uh, and then propose new solutions that we will hope uh, to develop then and implement. The committee uh, represents multiple sectors in Vegas uh, through CBOs or the members at large. There's about 15 members or votes. Um, we have a fairly good represent, uh, sort of youth representatives and at least two thirds of the membership are Vegas residents. So at least 10 of the members are Vegas residents as opposed to the researchers that are not in Vegas. This was the basic selection criteria. Uh, you know, they had to be interested in working with the project and adhere to the principles that we agree on. You know, they have to come to the meetings, uh, represent some, you know, have a representative and an alternate, uh, you know, be well respected in Vegas and the like. So here are the members, um, UMass Boston, uh, BU, School of Public Health at the University of Puerto Rico, uh, and then a number of organizations in Vieques, Isla Nena Composta, Incubadora Microempresa, Microempresa Vieque, La Colmena Cimarrona, Finca Conciencia, Vamos Puerto Rico, Vida de Quien Se Valen, here with Doña Vidna, uh, Iglesia Episcopal Todos Los Santos, and then several uh, members at large, Timari Cubero, uh, Raimundo Benjamin Bermudez, Yajaira Melendez, Ilse Guadalupe, and the Dr. Jose Figueroa. Now, so there's, you know, seven organizations. Um, so we're also a pretty transdisciplinary scientific team. Uh, we have social scientists, we have uh, folks in the natural scientists, uh, we have uh, engineers and urban planners, uh, you know, chemists, environmental scientists, and we have uh, Adriana, who is our project manager, and without whom we wouldn't be able to get anything organized, um, and Valeria Hernandez and, and Maria Pilar Botana, who are our wonderful doctoral students. Now, so far, we've had three steering committee meetings uh, on these dates, and these are basically the things that we ended up discussing, not necessarily the things we set out to discuss, but what we actually discussed. Um, the first one, of course, has the most uh, attendance, and I think mainly because all of the organizations came with multiple people to see what was going on. Um, and then for the, for the second and third meeting, they've actually only said one representative. So the attendance has, the number of people in the room has been fewer. Now we have uh, put together four subcommittees, uh, one uh, to develop CVPR principles, uh, you know, think about the health focus, the open community meetings, and the communication subcommittee. Now, the first one, uh, we really need to establish our own guiding principles. Um, there's many examples out there of other projects of CVPR principles, but there has to be community ownership of the project. And, you know, the community has to establish what are the principles that they want to do. And so these are the ones that we're, um, discussing as of right now. Uh, they have not been fully uh, accepted, you know, sort of signed on the dotted line by the full 
steering committee yet, but these are sort of where we're headed to. Um, it's important to note that people in Vegas were very, you know, they the, this subcommittee, you know, emphasized the importance to recognize the historical and cultural legacy at every stage and to respect ancestral knowledge. And, you know, that's, that was uh, very important. Uh, and also to emphasize that the process is of equal or, or even greater importance than the results. The uh, illness slash health uh, subcommittee, you know, the idea here is to really under think through, okay, so what are the health concerns of the, in the community? What can be directly linked to military activities? And what do we have the methodology and the technology to address, right? And how that coalesces into that will be the health focus. Um, and these are the things mm -hmm. that we're discussing right now, cancer, asthma, diabetes, Alzheimer's, hypertension, renal diseases, um, developmental and cognitive delays, uh, mental health and reproductive health. So it's a, so a very broad list. Um, and you know, there's discussion that as you saw from this slide is actually the, the biggest <laughs> subcommittee um, with a big representation also of scientists. Uh, and I, which is a really good thing because we have, there's a lot there of how to, you know, how to actually make all of these three things um, elements fit together. Um, then the open community meetings, right? We're talking about what are these meetings for? How do we work around COVID? What do we want to say? How do we want to say it? How should we promote it? Um, you know, and that actually coincides a lot with the communications meeting uh, subcommittee. So we're thinking about merging those. Um, but again, what is our message? Who are we reaching out to? What is the best way to do so, right? So in terms of the project itself, simple is better, uh, use a variety of methods. Uh, but think about, you know, what, the, what we're hearing is that emphasize the historical uh, legacy, right? The history of the Navy's presence, uh, what, they, what that meant socially, economically, and in terms of the contaminants. Uh, also the community's participation in the fight against the Navy and since then, and emphasize what the, the ways in which the project can contribute uh, for health, you know, healthy change in Vieques.